Greetings, the Lord is with you. <clears throat> and this is Pastor Bob Quaintance, Pastor at Good Hope Lutheran Church in Boardman, Ohio. I'm usually on at 7 o'clock in the evening, but uh, we have vacation Bible school this week from 6 to 8, and then I kind of get my costume off. I'm playing Moses this week, having a blast, um, and so I am uh, on later. And uh, um, we are in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we begin as we always do. Good evening, Fred. Uh, by making the sign of the cross and together saying we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, um, uh, the, um, uh, I was just seeing with Fred on that uh, we've been getting some posts from the group that went to Israel that he and I and his wife and my wife we were to be going to. Uh, but they had a grandchild being born, and we were buying a house and uh, needed to uh, um, be present for those things. Uh, but some of the experiences they've shared are really um, wonderful. I know, Fred, you've been there a couple of times, so we'll look forward at some point, Nina and I going. But this year we're where God wants us to be, and tonight we're where God wants us to be. That's in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, let's pause for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this word, and thank you for this magnificent book, the letter of, of Philippians. Father, bless us as we open your word and as you open our hearts to receive the word you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, I, I point to the Bible Project as a, a good, uh, I, I don't agree with quite everything, always, but, but a, a decent um, nine-minute video the Bible Project, uh, you can just Google it and uh, take you to the video on Philippians. And you'll see in the paper that I've highlighted that at the very center is the great Christ hymn from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And all the stories of Philippians, the rest of Philippians, revolves around that central theme that tells us who Jesus is and how we are to live in him. And at the end of the Christ hymn, we had the story of, uh, as an example of how we are to live, the story of Timothy and of Paphroditus. Now we're going to see the story of how, uh, in Paul's life, what is this meant for him uh, to live like Christ, who emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, to pay for our sins, and that God highly, highly exalted him, that at the name of Jesus and his name alone, every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Fa God the Father. Well, uh, as Paul has uh, a lot, used uh, Timothy and uh, Epaphroditus, people well known to the Philippian church, as an example of what that looks like in the life of an everyday Christian, now he'll turn to himself, not being proud, but interestingly, why, he's, we're going to see right away one of his old enemies coming up. Here we are. Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Not just rejoice, and, and joy and rejoicing and being glad is a major theme of the book of Philippians. But it's not just rejoicing, just be happy, um, but happy in the Lord. In the Lord changes everything. The phrase in Jesus or in Christ Jesus was at the heart of the book of Ephesians that we just got done reading last week. And it still is the heart of the life of, of a Christian. We are in Christ. Uh, God has placed us there uh, through our baptism. And in, in that mystical, mysterious work of God, um, that in Christ we have died and risen with him. Well, in Christ, in the Lord, we have reason to rejoice. He says then in verse 1, to write the same things to you, I suppose, as he's been writing to the other churches, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. <laughs> it's no trouble to repeat himself from one letter to another, especially when the truths are so central to the human condition and the heart of the gospel. So, it's no trouble for Paul to preach the good news um, and to preach Christ crucified. And it's safe for us when the true gospel is proclaimed. Well, what's the danger? 
And here's the old enemy, verse 2. Look out for the dogs. Uh, Paul doesn't pull any punches here. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Okay, we got it figured out. He's talking about the circumcision party, the ones that say, well, if you want to be a real Christian, here's what you need to do. And on one of the things on their list of what to do is you need to get circumcised. Something you do is going to make you a real Christian or a better Christian or a higher class Christian. Paul will have none of it. We are in Christ by God's work. In Ephesians, you remember, he said, but you were dead. You were dead, but God made you alive. You were dead, 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 dead. Couldn't do a thing uh, to save yourself. But God in mercy, rich in mercy, showed rich love toward you and saved you in Christ Jesus. Well, look out for people who preach anything other than Jesus Christ and him crucified, um, where Jesus gave up all his rights and became obedient and became a servant. Watch out for those people who are looking for rights and privileges based on what they do. They're not acting like Jesus. So that's how this is going to point back to the great Christ hymn in, in, Gen in uh, Philippians chapter 2. We are the circumcision, not of the flesh, but of the heart, who's worship, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus in what he's done. And we put no confidence in the flesh, not just circumcision, but in anything we do, we put no confidence. Though, Paul says, and here he's going to start using himself and his example of his life before Christ and his life after Christ. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh as opposed to in Christ, I have confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. If you want to share your bona fides by what you've done for God, um, let's compare lists. <laughs> you're you're going to lose if you compare to Paul. Um, I have, If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. <laughs> Exclamation point, end of sentence. But whatever gain I had, so if you want to have confidence in the flesh, take me on. Let's see who's got more. But where does that get you? Well, it'll send you straight to hell is where that'll get you. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I'll just pause right there. Remember in chapter one, it brought me to tears actually when I was teaching on it last Thursday. Paul was kind of wondering whether or not he looked forward to execution in prison and going and being with Jesus or surviving the sentence and, and um, uh, being declared not guilty and being able to go on and and do more work for Christ. And, and, and he said, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is, that is far better. He met Jesus, had a personal encounter with Christ um, for a few moments on the road to Damascus. I don't know how long it lasted, not long. And for three days, he was in prayer and fasting um, and God in Christ spoke to him in that time, told him a man by the name of Ananias was going to come and pray for him. Um, but he met Christ for just a few moments. But that meeting for a few moments with Christ 
changed his whole life. And he couldn't wait until the day he would see Jesus face to face. That's much better, Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, than living. You, it's, the, the Romans said, well, we can put you to death. Really? Good. <laughs> That'll be much better. You can't scare a guy like that. Paul says that that meeting with Christ changed everything for him. That old way of earning God's favor by everything I did, even persecuting Christians. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. When he met Jesus, his whole former life was meaningless. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish. It sounds like garbage you put out at the curb, but it's actually like dog excrement you got to pick up. Um, that's the real word, refuse of the bodily kind. It's a pile of manure. It's a stinking pile of manure. Sometimes we have a Pomeranian. I don't know why. Probably he's just a dog. He likes coming in, and, and he's been outside and comes in at night, and then he'll run to the bed and jump up on the bed to cuddle with you. And he's been rolling in something nasty he found. He is in heaven, whatever that smell is. That's what Paul's talking about. Well, he gets right off the bed and gets bathed immediately. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but a pile of manure in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, which is incomplete, imperfect, and leaves me a, a, a weak, ungodly enemy sinner, but one which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He could no longer deny him. He confessed faith in Jesus. And his life was dramatically, instantly changed because he was now placed in Christ. And his righteousness was a gift, not earned. Peace, joy, hope were his because God's grace was given to him. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And he, he writes here about four things. Um, he, he counts this loss, everything, the, the, the whole old way of holding on to life, uh, these dogs who are trying to impress God by things they do. It's the opposite of the Christian life. It's the opposite of the life of Jesus who let go of all his rights and privileges, nothing earned, he simply became a servant and obedient to the point of death. He humbled himself. Well, when we're trying to earn God's favor, we're not humbling ourselves. Paul let go of that pile of manure. And he's been transformed by the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And, and he, he counts it as a pile of rubbish so that, and you get this word that several times in the text, that I may gain Christ. If you're so full of yourself, you got no room for Jesus. That was Paul's life before Christ. And what did he get when he let go of the when, when he met Christ? Well, he dropped the pile of rubbish, <laughs> and and he, he gained Christ. It was a gift. And that number two, verse ten, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection. Yes, who are you, Lord? He said on the road. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You're alive? I thought it was a hoax. Nope. The power of the resurrection changed everything for Paul. That I may gain Christ and, and know him living and ascended in heaven and know the power of his resurrection and that I may share in his sufferings. Why? Because... I want to be with Jesus, and Jesus is with the suffering. And I want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him or conformed to him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> any means possible, it's a gift. 
Um, this is what I gain in Christ. But I gain not only pleasure, I gain the sufferings of Christ. But the sufferings of Jesus bring salvation to the world. What and what will they bring to you? God has plans for your life, and sometimes there may be suffering. Good evening, Mary Beth. Nice to see you on. And uh, others who have clicked on. So Paul is, again, using himself in an example of his life before Christ. Anything other than pointing the way to Jesus, just like those dogs in the circumcision party. But now, now in Christ, he counts that old way of living, trying to impress God by what he does, earn God's favor by what he does. He counts it a pile of manure. When, when we, we ought to come to church sometimes with, with uh, or listen to TV or radio evangelists with, with a plastic bag in our pocket so we can pick up the manure and throw it away. Sometimes we preach manure. Sometimes we preach grace. <laughs> Keep that stuff. Throw the manure away. We know it's manure when we're, we're talking about ourselves and everything we do to gain God's favor. We know it's grace and it's gospel and it's treasure. We talk about what Christ is doing in us and where he calls us to follow him. Paul goes on to say, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings and be like him in his death. Obedience, that's what we heard in the Christ hymn. He was obedient unto death. I want to be obedient to Christ, Paul says. I want to know that obedience that I too, like Christ, may be raised from the dead and, and brought into heaven. Yes, you will be. Then Paul, looking at his life now, not that I've, all, verse 12, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. No, Paul would never say that. Interestingly, before Christ, according to the law, he was blameless, perfect, not after meeting Jesus. Uh, the greatest saint in the church has a long way to go, most of the way. And that's what Paul says. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but what I do is I press on. I get up and I move forward. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This is the gift God has given me. I, I want to press on and claim it. I want to live into this gift. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I love this Philippians chapter three. Golly, what a, what a powerful go uh, gospel message in the book of Philippians. Forgetting what, one thing I do, I, I, I'm nowhere near what God wants me to be, but here's what I do. I press on, I'm moving forward. I'm not satisfied with my, my, my sins. I'm not gonna live with them. I'm gonna move forward. I forget what lies behind. I start afresh. We do that by repentance and receiving forgiveness and straining forward for what lies ahead. I want the new me that Christ see I want that new me to be a reality in my life more and more. I press on, verse 14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He stumbled and fell, fallen in the race, but there's still a race to win. I saw something on the internet, uh, a race. I don't know quite where I saw it, but girl falling down, running hurdles. Um, got up and beat the field by the end of the hurdles in her heat, and then in the next week, heat blew everyone away. Boy, Paul falls down, he gets up, and he keeps running. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he's not, God, he's not where he needs to be. He's not content just to stay the sinner he is. He presses on to become the person God wants him to be, has called him to be, has made him to be. I press on. Verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. Those of, those of us who are mature are invited to get on with Christ and the life he's calling you to live. 
one step at a time, confession, repentance, forgiveness, and get up and start again. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. I guess the immature think they don't need to try anymore, but not Paul. As a mature Christian, he's not perfect. He just gets up and starts walking again toward Christ. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. Remember in verse 1, excuse me, chapter 1, he said, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God's, Paul's confident that God's got this. Um, you don't have to worry about your own growth. God will take care of it. Just you look to him. When you fall down, get up and, and start walking toward him and his will for you. And the mature will think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God, God will reveal that to you. You don't need Paul. God will tell you where you need to get growing again. Only let us hold true to what we have attained, this freedom we have in Christ, a gift of Christ, not earning God's righteousness, but receiving it by faith. Verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. Um, he says, I, if, if we're called to imitate Christ, well, we have the stories in the gospel, but God has given us brothers and sisters in Christ to imitate. Some are godly parents. Some are friends or fellow church members we respect. Well, if you respect them, imitate them. The, the highest form of flattery, isn't it? Brothers, join in imitating, imitate me. In, in, not in how great Paul is, but how he's dependent on God. And how when he falls down, he gets back up and he, he begins to follow Christ again. And his focus is on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me. And not just me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. There's other brothers and sisters who, who, whose life of faith you respect. Fo follow their example. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the gift of salvation by the death of Jesus. They want to, those dogs, those evildoers in the beginning of the chapter, they want to focus on what they do to earn God's favor. They walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body and be like his, to be like his glorious body. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus. He's coming. We're not citizens of this world where Caesar is Lord, or the almighty dollar is Lord, or popularity or beauty is Lord. No, um, our citizenship is in heaven where Jesus is Lord. And from heaven we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, our sinful, weak, ungodly self. He will transform it to be like his glorious body. <laughs> he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He'll do it by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. One day he will be Lord of all. He is now, and he will be. There's the end of chapter 3, but it really ends with the first verse of chapter 4. I'll end by reading it, and we'll start by reading it tomorrow. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Well, thank you for joining me with chapter three. Just how can you not love chapter one, chapter two, chapter three? 
of uh, of uh, Philippians. It's like they're fabulous, and they just keep getting better. Tomorrow we get chapter four. <laughs> Can't get any better. Uh, chapter four is pretty good, but nothing's better than chapter two. Uh, let's end with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for the time in your word this evening. Uh, thank you for the children who came to Vacation Bible School tonight. Thank you for their encounter with you, Lord, who the God who is with us. And so we are invited to trust in God, trust in you. Bless this week the, the workers, the, the, the volunteers, and all the children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with me. God bless you. And remember, God loves you. And so do I. Bye-bye.